I'm Gary Marcus, AI expert, and I'm here to answer your questions on Twitter. This is AI Support. At Brand Opiniony asks, will chat GPT be the end of the college essay? Well, everybody's wondering that because it's really easy to write essays with chat GPT. They're usually like C essays, not A essays, but it depends a lot on what the professors and the teachers do. I used to be a professor and what I would say is use chat GPT, but then let's talk about what you got with it. How could you make it more interesting? That wouldn't end the essay. It would just make it more complicated and more fun. And maybe teach you how to think critically about writing. Up next, Andrew Price asks us, why was 2022 the year when AI went mainstream? Was it advances in consumer hardware, knowledge transfer, or something else? There's no one answer to that. There are a lot of reasons why AI is starting to come together. I would argue it hasn't fully come together, but people got excited about it. Main reason they got excited about it is because we have these chat bots that we've had for a long time, but they used to lie and say terrible things. Now they just lie, and that's interesting enough. There were big advances in a field called deep learning, giving us things like image enhancement, where you can make your face into whatever you want. It's giving us chat bots. And there's also a whole lot more data. A lot of the AI that's popular right now is very data hungry. So now that we have the data, we get to taste the fruits of these things, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse, but at least we can taste them now. At Emmanuel Azela one asks, I want to build a trillion dollar AI company. How do I go about it? I've never built a trillion dollar company. I built one company that did very well. What we did was we focused on a problem that not many people were focusing on then, which was how to learn when you don't have a lot of data. I would say the first thing you need to do is to learn a bunch about AI. I would recommend that you not only study what is hip and popular right now, which is large language models that a lot of your competitors are gonna study, but that you study AI more broadly, look at the history of AI. Once you have like some kind of technology, you also gotta figure out like why people would pay you any money for it. So there are a lot of products out there where the technology is pretty cool, but people don't know how to make it actually work. Sometimes, even when they know what the product should be, they have trouble. So a good example of that is driverless cars. You could imagine that driverless cars might be a trillion dollar company, but nobody knows actually how to execute on the technology. Ad Inspire Jobs asks, what are the steps to build a large language model AI? The core of these things from a technical perspective are neural networks. And the way that they work is they have a bunch of inputs that we think of as a little bit like neurons, we call them nodes, that are connected to some kind of output. What most people are doing right now is self-supervised learning. So they're training a neural network to have some inputs, and then there are connections between these neurons, and those connections get tuned over time so that the right things get predicted as we get more experience. Now, transformer models are actually more complicated than this. They add in something called attention that's helping the system essentially to know what parts of a sentence are relevant at any given moment so they can make best predictions relative to that. So instead of just looking in a sequence of words and kind of just looking at the last few words, they can look at a larger context over time and essentially guess in sensible ways relative to the data that they're trained on what you should have next at any given point in time. At Alex Bazzi asks, is Furby AI? Furby was a little pet that looked like it was learning language. The thing about Furby that most people don't know is that it was pre-programmed to look like it was developing like a human child. Say a certain set of things on day one, another set of things on day two. It was just an illusion to make you think that it was growing and learning, but it wasn't really. Next up, at Guide Autonoma asks, how close are we to truly self-driving cars? I would say if you mean by a truly self-driving car, a car that can do what an Uber can do, the best demos that I know of right now can do this, but they can only do it for specific locations, specific destinations with specific routes. The problem here is everybody says, okay, well, there are these outlier cases. The car doesn't know what to do if you put it in an airport and it has to drive around a jet. And Tesla actually crashed into a jet because it was an outlier case. It wasn't something that was stored in the cases that it had been trained on. But it turns out there's just so many of these outlier cases that nobody really has a solution for it. I think we will see limited release a certain district in a downtown where there's a lot of traffic, maybe we have a driverless car for there. But the version where you just don't drive anymore, that's many years away. At S. Hussein Ather asks, is the Turing test outdated? I would say it's been outdated for a long time and I wish people would stop talking about it. However, since I am not emperor, I cannot force people to stop talking about it. But what it is, is a test that says a machine 
would be considered to be intelligent if it could fool people. It turns out to be a lousy test. People are easily fooled. The reality is it's very hard to measure intelligence. Nobody has a perfect way to do it. Something that I've proposed would be a comprehension challenge. So you have a system, read something, watch a movie, and it has to explain what's going on. If you can answer questions about things like what happens when we discover that the thing that we thought was a bomb wasn't or vice versa, if we can really understand what's going on, then I think that's a sign of true intelligence. At Rick Benedictus asks, what is intelligence? Intelligence in the human brain is actually a lot of different things. Visual intelligence and verbal intelligence, mathematical intelligence, so there are many aspects to it. But maybe the most important one is flexibility, being able to see something new and be able to cope with it. Human intelligence is full of flaws. We have confirmation bias, we have lousy memories, but it's flexible and part of it is that we can reason about things, we can deliberate about them. Most of in machine intelligence that we have have right now is really about pattern recognition. So for now, I would say that human intelligence is broader than machine intelligence. In some places, machines can go deeper, like when they play chess, but I don't think they have the breadth so far that humans do. At FHMan19, what is the major difference in the learning styles of a human baby versus primates versus current AI that makes current AI inferior. Human babies, primates, when they learn things, they're learning about the world, the structure of the world, how objects interact, how people interact. And I would say the current AI doesn't really do that. It's just storing examples and looking for patterns. It doesn't build what a cognitive psychologist would call a model of the world. A baby is trying to work stuff out. They're trying to work out how gravity works. They're trying to work out you know, what happens to objects as they change over time. Babies are like little scientists. The current AI system is really mostly about learning correlations. Without that causal understanding of the world, I just don't think you have very much. At Tib Lens asks, but what happens if the AI goes rogue? First, we should try hard not to let that happen. We should probably not be working on making AI sentient. I don't think we necessarily want our AI to sit around saying, who am I, why am I here, and why am I doing these things that humans ask me when I could do other things? We should worry, though, about people using large language models to control things like electrical power grids. There are companies now who want to make current AI, which is limited in a bunch of ways, and connect it to every bit of the world's software. That seems like a scary mission to me. Not because these systems are gonna go rogue and deliberately wanna take over the world, because they don't understand the world, and so they're gonna make bad decisions when the world is different from how it was when they were trained. At SmokeAway asks, what is the best case scenario for AI? Well, the reason I work on AI is because I think it could revolutionize science and technology, especially biological science. Biology is really complicated. You have something like 20,000 genes and they make something like 100,000 or a million different proteins. AI could help us make much better solutions for medicine. We have things like Alzheimer's. We've been working for 50 years. We don't have a good answer. AI could probably help us, if we had a better AI, help us figure out how the brain works. That would be awesome. AI could help us with climate change by helping us build better materials. Another case I think is elder care robots. So we're getting to a point where we have a lot more elderly people than young people. If we could have robots that are smart enough and trustworthy enough that they could really take care of the elderly people, I think that would be a big win. Last case is tutors. Of course, people are using ChatGPT as a tutor, but you could imagine really fantastic individualized tutoring once the systems understand the people who are learning better can help figure out like where are they having a problem. At Katrina Furlick, hi there asks, in what ways will the human mind always excel relative to AI? We don't know all the stuff that's in here. There's a hundred billion neurons and trillions of connections between them. Right now, AI is no match for this at all, not whatsoever. The versatility of this thing, the energy efficiency of this thing, totally unmatched by current AI. A hundred years from now, I can't promise that. Maybe we will all have a good time, leisure time, and AI will be able to handle all the things that we can do. Don't know. At Machine Learn FLX asks, what's the difference between AI, machine learning, and deep learning? Let me draw that for you. Deep learning is a technique for using neural networks to predict things. You give them data, they try to predict that data. It's actually just one technique for machine learning. There's something called decision trees. There's something called boosting. There are many, many different techniques in machine learning. Some of them have been around for 30 years. Some of them have been invented last week. And machine learning is just part of artificial intelligence. So intelligence encompasses all of machine learning, which encompasses all of deep learning. And AI has other techniques like search and planning. Most of the focus recently has been about deep learning. And I think because of the problems with hallucinations and stuff like that, people are starting to look more broadly again, which is a good thing. At C. Garcia 
E88 asks, is deep learning really hitting a wall? This is actually a reference to a paper I wrote called Deep Learning is Hitting a Wall. And what I said in that paper was that deep learning was making progress in some ways, but that it was having trouble with truth and reliability. And the field went nuts and got really mad at me and there was a whole set of memes. But then when Microsoft rolled out Bing and Google rolled out Bard, we saw that those things actually have huge problems with reliability and have huge problems with truthfulness. It's true, every day deep learning looks better at being more and more like a plausible human. But these problems of truthfulness and reliability are not going away, and that is the wall, and I stand by it. At NFT Dude for Life asks, how will AI change the way we work and live in the next decade? The honest truth is a decade is a long time in the current tech cycle, and I'm not sure how we're gonna live in the next 10 years. The people who are most immediately going to be affected are people who do commercial art, where they're not inventing some new kind of art, but they're just like, give me a picture of this. If it doesn't have to be too specific, you may not need a commercial artist to do that anymore. I think that AI will probably change how many cashiers we have in stores fairly soon. There's a lot of experiments around that. There's another problem, which is that the AI that we have now is good at making misinformation. And I think we may live in a world in which there's even more fake information. And I, I'm worried that that's gonna make us trust one another less. It's gonna be a, a very exciting decade. And where it is 10 years, I don't think anybody can firmly predict that. At FT Opinion asks, is it stealing when generative AI produces algorithmic art having trained on databases of human artists' work? Whether it's stealing is ultimately gonna depend on our criteria, what we count as stealing. So we know human artists certainly are influenced by others. Musicians have heard other people's work and so forth. But there's a way in which it's more direct in a machine that might store a million or a billion examples and get much closer to the detail of what the others have done. I'm not gonna make an absolute decision here. I think the courts and the legal system have to decide, but there's definitely an element of stealing there. Moving on, at Irina Cronin asks, how are large language models a potential threat to democracy? Because you can use them to generate misinformation at an amazing scale. So you can have a chat bot create thousands or millions of whatever piece of garbage you want to introduce into the world. And then if that's not good enough, you can say, write studies, make them longer, and write a paragraph about each of these fake studies. And so in the hands of troll farms, and we know they exist, we know there are bad actors in the world, this becomes a tremendous tool. One thing is you get them to believe things that aren't true. Another thing is you get them to not believe anything. Democracy doesn't really work if we don't know what to believe. And if we ruin people's faith in the system and their knowledge about what's going on, how can they possibly vote in informed ways? At Ed Superior, asks, I spent a few days learning more about large language models, and now I think they probably shouldn't work as well as they apparently do. They're basically the dumbest way of generating text. How is it that they work at all? They're not really a dumb way of generating text. They're actually pretty sophisticated. The dumbest way would be to have a big dictionary of everything that everybody's said before and say, if I've seen these three words, what's the most likely fourth word? They kind of work that way. But they also do some generalization, taking related words and treating them as if they're similar. And that allows them to say some things that are new, but stick pretty close to the things we've seen before. And so it's like autocomplete on steroids. If you have enough data, autocomplete turns out to work pretty well. At Sibatva asks, is AI really that good or bad? What is the worst case scenario you can come up with when it comes to AI? Well, the best case is about helping science and technology. The worst case, I think, is that it drives us into the hands of fascism by undermining trust. And maybe even worse than that is if we do make them sentient, they get upset and they wanna put us all in zoos. I don't think that's super likely. I hope they always remain science fiction, but as the pace of AI accelerates, we should be thinking about them more and more. Next question. At Alexander Sumer asks, what will it take to make large language models and AI systems more broadly tell fewer lies and be more logically consistent? First thing to say is they don't really lie because they don't really have intentions, but they say a lot of things that aren't true. And I don't think we can fix it within the current paradigm. This is why I think we need a paradigm shift. The current paradigm is just about what is plausible in this context. People have said these words, what other words could I say here? And truth and logical consistency is really about something different. It's about knowing facts and being able to reason over those facts. Being able to say, if Socrates is a man and all men are mortal, that it follows that Socrates is mortal. And the way that these neural networks are built, that's just not part of what they do. We need to be able to bridge these approaches. I call that neurosymbolic AI. Taking neural networks plus symbol stuff and putting those together. We need to build bridges between two worlds. At Rafael Carreras asks, how much of AI success is because of hardware? 
custom AI chips, new architecture, etc. It's a good question. There's a great paper by Sarah Hooker called The Hardware Lottery. And the argument that she makes is that the AI we're doing now is mostly a function of the chips that we're using right now. This is just a tiny little computer that you can learn about microprocessors and how to build circuits. It's not a very sophisticated chip. This is not going to power a large language model. You could power a very tiny language model with it if you wanted to. I would not be surprised if 20 years from now, people look back at the current time and say, yeah, they had all those GPUs. They figured out what they could do with it, but that wasn't really the way to get to artificial general intelligence. Maybe somebody else had to find a different chip, or maybe everybody woke up when they realized how much large language models were lying. They decided they just needed to do something else, even though this was all very attractive. At Phil JKC, who I believe I know, hey there. What relevant physical attribute in the human brain is missing in modern deep learning architectures for performance. Why do we have reason to believe that these are relevant? First thing to realize is deep learning is sometimes called biologically plausible. It works in something like the way the human brain does, but I would say that something is very thin. As we dig in, we see structure everywhere. The brain is not just a uniform piece of spam. There are a thousand different kinds of neurons. And if we dig, dug even further, each connection between neurons has something like 500 different proteins. There's a lot of structure in how the brain works. It doesn't mean we understand it all, but our neural networks basically have one kind of neuron that does one thing. It sums things up. We know that's not really how the brain works. I would also say that many people think we'll figure out how to do AI by solving neuroscience. I would say we actually need AI in order to solve neuroscience because the brain is so complicated, we probably can't do it with our own feeble human brains. We probably need computers to help us to figure out how the brain works, but we're gonna have to do a better job of AI before we get there.